Hey Robot Makers, how you doing? Hope you're having a good day so far. So, do you want to know how to use the the Raspberry Pi? I was going to say Raspberry Pi. It's actually the Pi Moroni Pico RGB keypad base, which is a bit of a mouthful to say, with MicroPython. Then this is the show for you. Uh, so let's dive straight in. My name is Kevin. Come with me as we learn how to build robots, bring them to life, and have a whole load of fun along the way. And today we're going to try something we've not done before. We're going to try doing a live interview. So waiting in the wings, I have Ovi Desire. Uh, he's going to be joining the show uh, slightly later on, and uh, we're going to uh, give you a bit of an update on what he's been doing so um and if this is something that works well <laughs> it is there's a lot of riding on this technology wise and um connection wise because this is from uh, coming from nigeria as well so uh, let's see how that works out later on but before we do that let's get over to the pico rgb keypad let me just rewind my slides a bit there so yes this is all about the raspberry pi pico rgb keypad so let's have a look what this session's about then. So what can it actually do? How do we program it with MicroPython? Some potential uses for it. Uh, a bit of a quick demo as well. And uh, as I said just uh, earlier, Meet the Maker. This is the new segment of the show that I'm looking to, to build out as well. Okay, so this um, RGP keypad, RGB keypad, <laughs> is something I bought a while ago. Um, and I've, I've, I've been using it more of a breadboard than anything else, and I've re really not been using the keys, and I'll get into one of the reasons why that is. Um, well, in fact, we're, we're talking about it on this show here, actually. Um, so let me just, uh, there we go. Sorry, Ovi's just joining in the, the green room, <laughs> which is uh, just off to the screen, um, but he'll be joining me slightly later. Yes, yeah, so the official RGB uh, keypad page from the manufacturer uh, allows you to download a custom firmware, a U, uh, UF2 file. Uh, what they've done is they've taken MicroPython, the latest build, and then they've added to that a custom library that enables these keypads, because it's got RGB LEDs and buttons, um, so that it works seamlessly with MicroPython. And I've got two thoughts about that that I'll share in a, in a couple of seconds time. Um, but it, may, it means that it's very easy to use. You just download the image, drag it across to the Raspberry Pi Pico and flash it just like you would normally. Uh, and the link is just on the screen there if you wanted to check out their tutorial as well about how to use this. Okay. So what can we actually use this RGB keypad uh, for then? So it's got a couple of features. Um, it is actually quite a simple device. So it has 16 individually addressable RGB LEDs with a button underneath. Uh, and they're quite soft to touch. If I just go to the uh, overhead camera for a second, these are actually quite soft to touch. Um, they've got kind of a rubbery, they don't make any kind of click. I just zoom in a bit on there so you can see a bit easier. Um, so they're quite rubbery. Uh, they don't make any kind of sound and they've got like a tack switch underneath them, but they've also got uh, an LED. Um, so the button states very easy to read. We can just grab any of the button states. We actually get, um, there's a function to grab all states and it'll just give you a true or false for every single button at that moment in time. So you can actually press multiple buttons at once, all 16 if you had enough digits to do that. And there's a library for setting and getting the current value of each button and LED as well. So you can get the is it pressed and do you want to actually set up the, the RGB LED for any particular value? Uh, and there's also a socket for plugging the Pico in. So this is one of the things I find most useful about this. So I can actually wire up um, a project. I can plug in a Raspberry Pi Pico. I don't have to worry about soldering it or anything like that. Uh, so it's kind of like a breadboard. It's got the, um, the pins exposed. Again, if I go to the overhead there, you can see just about there's a whole series of pins down each side which means I can plug in, but almost more importantly is the actual um, labels for them as well. So you can easily see the ground and you can see all the different uh, GP pins rather than just the pin number themselves. Um, and it's very project friendly for that reason. So this is one of the reasons I used it. Uh, I used it last week when we were looking at the um, NRF 24L01 uh, radio boards. Uh, I had one in there and I had one in the, the other Raspberry Pi Pico starter kit. And um, I would also say it's very sturdy as well. So uh, yes, they're very, very, uh, very useful for project work. So um, how to program the keypad. So from a MicroPython point of view, we want to be able to address um, the, the the LEDs themselves as well as the buttons. And they, they're actually in a matrix array. So it's a four by four uh, grid and you can use an X and Y coordinate to get at each of them. 
So they will start from the top left is strangely zero column three. So row zero column three. Uh, and obviously zero is is an index. It's a an array thing. Normally we, as a human, we would start counting at one, but machines always start at zero because that's a number two. Um, and yes, we would simply read a button state using the XY coordinates, and we can also set the RGB value as well using an XY coordinate, but providing the red, green, and blue val values individually as a one byte, so as a number between 0 and 255. So for example, 255, 255, 255 is white, and 0, 0, 0 would be black. And there's lots of other combinations of uh, those values to give you every color that you could possibly imagine. So how we actually do this in MicroPython is very, very straightforward. This is what I love about this board. It's very simple to use. So there's a library that we can bring in, and I'll show you a link to that in a second, uh, which is just called RGB Keypad. And there is a thing called Auto Update. So you can actually have that uh, enabled, which is the default value, or you can actually turn it off. And this is a bit like a frame buffer in that um, you can either have it so that every time you toggle a value, it will update the button there and then, but if you're doing some kind of animation across all the buttons and all the lights, uh, you'll actually see it kind of sweep across in a kind of very quick zigzag formation. It is noticeable. So to actually stop that kind of visible um, redrawing of all the buttons, you can say auto update is false, set all the values and then just do an update. You can just say um, keypad to update and it will draw everything instantaneously. And that's much quicker um, and it looks it looks much more smoother. So that's how we actually set up the board. To read a button state, it simply key is pressed. So we we, we would um, initialize a value, um, a variable that's called key, and we would say key equals keypad, and then in the square brackets, the X and Y coordinates, and we'll have a look at that in some code in a minute. And then we can just say is key dot is pressed, or if key is pressed, and it will say true or false for that. We can also then look at the key color. So if we want to set the key color, it's simply just key dot color and then equals and then R, G and B, which is just red, green and blue bytes. So we can set them in advance and we can do all kinds of clever maths with them as well, which we will get onto in a minute to do all some clever stuff. So as I said earlier, Pimeroni have actually provided a custom MicroPython build. Um, and that's how it came with the original release of this. And when I saw that, I was like, hmm, not sure I like that approach. I would much prefer to have a library file that I upload to the Pico, and then I can decide if I'm using that or not later on, uh, rather than having like a custom firmware, because that's quite a thing for them to maintain. They would have to keep updating that version of MicroPython every time a new version comes out. Um, and, you know, that, that causes fragmentation over time. If you think we have... We have the official MicroPython, then we have the flavor that's running on, say, a microbit. We have the flavor that's running on um, all the Adafruit stuff, CircuitPython. We've now got Pimeroni with their own version of it. Um, you know, that's not a great situation. That's fragmentation. So I don't really like that. Uh, another thing is it creates bloat as well. So there's lots of extra stuff that's going to be added in there so it started off as just being the uh, the pico library for the rgb keypad and now they've added in other libraries as well so there's lots of stuff on there that i don't need and that will actually eat away at the ram that's available as you're running the thing because it has to open up all the um the library at once there's no way to opt in and out which bits you want um which is what i would prefer to do and also it means that the storage on the board, it might only be a very small amount, but these are quite small boards anyway. So I would rather be the person making the decision on that rather than the manufacturer just stuffing stuff in there. And um, it also means if they update the library, they have to reflash the entire firmware every time they do a, a code fix. So again, that's not really great from a, from a development point of view. So, however, there is a standalone version that has been developed by Martin O'Hanlon, and he's a member of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So if you go to github.com slash Martin O'Hanlon slash Pico dash RGB keypad, you can download a standalone version and just upload that to your regular off the shelf official Raspberry Pi Pico MicroPython. And you can then use the, the RGB keypad with that. So that's what I've gone with. And that's what these uh, these things are going to be seeing today are all built around. So one of the functions that I've used in quite a few projects now is the map function. And this is a beautiful piece of code. It's one of them things that you can just keep using again and again in lots of different scenarios, and it just keeps on giving. So simply what this, I say simply, it looks complex. It is actually very simple what it returns to you. So if you have a value 
And so in our case, I want to know what the RGB value is between two colors. So say I take the red value and I've got a value of say 128 and I want to smoothly move that between 128 to 255. And I want one piece of code to do this and it doesn't matter whether the, the value I'm passing in is zero to you know, 45 or 250 to 255, it will work out even if the one is higher and the other is lower, it doesn't matter. So they're, they're the, the, the out values, there's the out min and out max that we have on the screen there. The in values are going to be a percentage in this case. Um, so I want to map a value that I'm going to pass in. I'm going to pass in a percentage between 0 and 100%, which is these two in values. And it's going to map them between this 128 and 255. So we start out there in this little matrix I've uh, just put on the screen. So 0%, it's the same value. So 128 is in, 128 is out. If I set that X to be 10%, so I want to mix the colors slightly. I want 10% of the... Uh, out value mixing in with the in value. So what it will do there is it will work out what 10% of that value is and it'll, it returns the value 141. And you can see there as we build up the percentages to 100% we finally get 255 which is the value that we want to have. So it smoothly maps the values as we're increasing the percentage. Now I've used this for adjusting color values so I can fade them in and out between two color values but I've also used the exact same code for servo easing. So I wanted to say um, a value, I wanted to know what the pulse width value was between zero and what was the pulse width, um, say 1024. And I could pass in um, a degree that I want this to move to. So I could say I want um, 45 degrees and the in value is zero between zero and 180. And the out min and out max will be 0 to 1024, for example. And what it will output for me is what the pulse width should be for any given angle. So it's a really beautiful piece of code, works in all kinds of scenarios. And it doesn't matter if the values are different ways around. The way that it works, it just produces what you need. It scales it for you. So it looks quite a complicated thing. But when you see what it does, it just works. And it's really quick as well. So it's a single line of code, it just returns the value that we're after. So that's the map function. We're going to use that um, in our code today. And I'm going to use that function in this fade key. So I'm going to fade between two color values. Uh, I'm going to take the R, G and B value for each of them. I'm going to put them in a loop. I'm going to increment that loop. Um, I'm, I'm using 0 to 100 in my loop um, just as a percentage. I thought that was easy to work with. And then I'm going to map the percentage N that we've just looked at between the out min and out max. So the out min and the out max in this case is the color I'm passing it from and the color that it's going to be fading to. And I, I simply say R will become the output of that. So if, I, if, if N is 10%, it's going to run that through that map function and it's going to give us that 140, 48 was it, uh, as the R value. Uh, and it will do them for each of the three. And the reason that this map function is so cool is those numbers might be different between the in and the out, the color from the color to. Um, and this map function will just figure all that out for us. And what we will get is this really smooth transition. Uh, the last number there in the range function, you might have seen this before. So this is from and to, and this is the step. So when it goes through that, you can actually make it increase by two instead of by just doing one each time. You could have that as 10 or whatever you want. And that will speed up or slow down the fading. So at the moment, um, if I go to my overhead, you can see there that that key is flashing away. And that is the code that we can see on screen that's running that. So it's going between zero and 100. And I've simply passed in the color. Black is the color it's going from. And then red is the color it's going to. And then I'm also then doing another one where I say go from red to black. So it kind of fades in and fades out, fades in and fades out. And then what we do after we've got the R, G and B values, we then say for any given key that we're passing in, um, and we've actually provided the X and Y of the key that we want to fade. So we can then say um, key is keypad X and Y, and then key color is the R, G and B that we've passed in there. So that will actually set that key, and it will mean that if we run this function, um, we can actually get it to nicely fade between those values. 
So potential uses, what could we use this for? So I've actually seen somebody have has actually built like a drum machine using this exact board. I, I thought of like a, a Tenori On, which you might have seen. They were quite a trend a couple of years ago in the early 2000s. It was it Little Boots, one of the um, 80s style um, retro musicians. She had one of these and it's like this, but it's got more keys on. It's got uh, probably about 64 buttons on it, but it's the same kind of thing. There's a flashing LED or a lightable LED under each button and you can press them and use it as an instrument. You could use it as a, like a door entry. You could use it as a um, remote control for a robot. So I'm certainly looking at that. So you can use it as kind of an up, down, left, right, backwards, forwards kind of thing. Mood lighting. You could also just have it just on the wall as like a, a light. It is quite bright, actually. And you can set the brightness to be really, really bright or um, an acceptable level. I think I've got it at half the value at the moment. Uh, and you can also use it and um, create your own game as well. I was thinking, you know, you could even create like... Um, snake type game where it's sort of going round. I mean it's not a very big playing board but uh, you could certainly do that as well. So yeah it could be a film prop. Um, thanks Adam. It, there's so many things you could do with this. Um, I don't think I've even scratched the surface yet so uh, loads of potential uses for this. So if you're enjoying the show and you've not already subscribed and the number of people who watch this who don't subscribe is getting even larger uh, as more people find the channel. So um, make sure you, you do subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and um, Leave me a comment as well if you if you want to add something, you want to comment on something. Certainly uh, don't be shy of doing that. And um, you'll find all those things next to the like button as well. Um, what else can I say about this? So yes, I do a new video every single Sunday around 7 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. We're actually Greenwich Mean Time plus one at the moment. But that's going to come to an end, I think, at the end of next month. Um, and uh, I do also have a website that you can visit as well. So if you go to smartsfan.com, you'll find all kinds of stuff about robotics, uh, about all the different robots that I build, all the code, links to videos, and also um, a learning platform where you can learn robotics and an introduction to Python as well. So yes, there is that. Um, what else is there? If you want to help out the show and pay for my rather expensive overhead camera that I purchased recently, um, you can certainly help out by going to buymeacoffee.com slash Kevin McAleer. If you're watching live now, you can also do a super chat. So if you're on YouTube, you can uh, hit the super chat button at the bottom. I think it's one of the little dollar symbol. And um, that will also just um, give me a kind of tip or, um, on the show as well. So um, don't be shy of using the super chat thing. I think there is also a YouTube subscription that you can actually join as well. And that also just uh, helps pay for all the stuff I have to use to produce this show. And um, if I go to this shot, is it? Nope, not that one. Let me see if I can find the right camera. Uh, if I go to this shot here, it's this camera over here. I'm trying to show you. You can see there's quite a lot of setup um, to, to make a, a show like this. So um, any little helps. Um, Anything you can spare. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> okay, let's go over to a demo and then we can get on to the uh, the interview with Ovi. So let's go to Visual Studio Code. So if I break out here and go to Visual Studio, uh, I've got my Raspberry Pi Pico plugged in. I'm just going to cancel out the code that it's running. I'm also just going to get rid of that for a second. Okay, let's just uh, do that. Right, so I'm running just regular... Um, MicroPython. You can see the board there is just frozen. It doesn't actually um, update these um, all the time, only when the code is actually running. So Rich is saying, use the keypads for cameras. Absolutely. You might have noticed I have a Stream Deck on my, my setup just down here at the bottom. Uh, the Stream Deck is like a whole load of buttons. You could create a Stream Deck, just not with the, the nice buttons on there. Okay, so... Let's go back over here. So I've got some code up here I'm going to show you. Let me just bring down, I'll, I'll run a few demos and you can see um, what they all do. So the first one, this is the demo code that um, I think comes with the Raspberry, with, with the board if you, if you go to the site. So let me just find that. So they talk about PicoPad. I've actually removed um, that library, so that probably won't work. Um, so instead of doing that, let's have a look at my code instead. So I've created um, my own function that's called RGB. And this is simply to hold RGB values in a nice class. So I've simply got an RG and B value. I've just set them all to none if nothing's passed in. And self just means hide these away in this particular instance because we're going to use a lot of these. So each of them have got a red, green and blue value. 
I then created a property, which just means you can just set the, the value of this RGB thing just by passing in a red, green, and blue. Um, you can either set them or you can receive them with the property. So the setter is the thing that sets the values. It expects to have a, an R, G, and a B. But you can see there, non means you don't have to provide them. But how are you supposed to set it if you don't provide them? <laughs> hey, Tom. Um, so it simply will just um, set them if they are a value. And the property just returns all three values, red, green, and blue. I always make sure it's in that order as well, just to make sure we don't confuse things. And then finally, just for debugging, I've got a show function. So it simply just prints out the red, green, and blue value for each of them internal values. So that's um, a class that I've created just called RGB. Um, we can ignore colors. That was something I was trying that didn't work. And let's go to main, which is the main piece of code. Right, so there's a lot in here, but actually what it does is quite straightforward. So I brought in time and sleep. I brought in the RGB keypad, which is that library that Martin has written. I brought in my own RGB code and we can just get rid of colors. That's something that was a bit of an experiment that didn't work. And um, I'll just experiment with RGB. So actually we don't need that. So what I've then do is I set up a few colors so I can just refer to them by name rather than uh, having to type in the three values every single time. And sometimes you'll forget these because it's a bit abstract. So blue is simply, if we think red, green and blue, blue is full 100% on, uh, red and green are zero. Similar with red, red, green and blue. So red is 100%. Green is the middle value, red, green, blue. Purple is the first and the last value. So red and blue our 100% and there is nothing in the green. Uh, I added plum there, just why not? I, I saw that on there, I was like, I like the, I like the name plum. Yellow is uh, red and green are full on and there is nothing in the blue. Cyan is, there is no red, but there is green and blue. Orange is kind of a halfway, so that it's full on red, half the value of green, nothing in blue. White is everything and blue is all zeros. So by doing that, it means I can just um, pass in the name of the color and I can then have my code do stuff with that. So next, I then create a, a keypad object just by using the RGB keypad. I toggle that uh, auto update to false, as I talked about earlier, and I've set the brightness to be half. Uh, I can put that as full if I want, but it is pretty blindingly bright. <laughs> uh, we've got 16 keypads on this. Um, I this was from the original code that I borrowed from the demo. They talked about that as if uh, they were going to do different models with different number of pads on there. So I've just included that as well. Um, and then the button states, I'd simply get the button states by um, loading up keypad.getkeyspressed and you'll get an array of true and falses from 0 to 16 at 15. There's my map function that we looked at earlier. There's a clear function that simply does keypad.clear and it just clears all the values that we have there. And then color. So color will take in a weight value. And that's just how, how long do we want it to sleep for in between doing refreshes. Um, there is a fade value, uh, which is a string either fade in or fade out. And then there's an RGB value as well. So this will simply just set a color uh, for the entire board. So all 16 keys. So if fade is nothing, then I'm just assuming that to be fade in. If the RGB is nothing, I'm going to expect that to be 255. Now you can actually do 0FF with that little X there, and that just means use a hexadecimal value rather than an integer. Uh, sometimes you'll see that like with web colors, they'll use um, hexadecimal for the colors. So yes, all cool. And then to actually fade in the color, so I start out with I, so I want to go from black to white on, on each of these. I then do for X and Y, so for the rows and the columns, and there's four of each of them, so that's why that's four in the range. We then do key equals keypad X and Y, so depending on which of these it's looping through, and then we set the red, green, and blue value to be whatever I is currently. So I is either it's somewhere between zero and 255. So they'll uniformly become brighter, so they'll start out as a, a dark gray, and they'll, they'll progressively get whiter. So key.color is R, G, and B, and that will set the color. Uh, fade out just as the opposite in effect. It just minuses I each time it goes round. Uh, and then I've got a fade in, um, fade out function. So this will bring up a value and then bring it back down again. So this was my first attempt at um, doing this, but then fade key is the one I've actually um, am most happy with. So that's the one we've looked at earlier. 
And I've simply also got the end of that. If a key is pressed, then print out what the key value is, change the color to be um, white. Uh, um, so that's not white, is it? That's uh, green and blue, whatever that ended up being at the top. We update the keypad and we update it after it. So if I run this code, um, let me just scroll down a bit further to show you what, what actually happens. I've, I've got a function called rainbow that simply fades between black and cyan, cyan and blue, blue and green, green and yellow, yellow, orange, orange, red, red, orange. Or it just fades between loads of colors. Um, and then I've set a, a, a couple of specific keys to do specific things. So I'll show you this demo. Um, and I've then got two while loops. So the first one is while we've not pressed um, the start button, which is the top left button there, uh, it will just keep fading everything from black to red. So uh, it'll just be one key going black to red, which is the key that's lit up there um, until I press that start button and then it will drop down into this one here. And depending if I press button one, two or three, so that's button one, two or three or which is just the very bottom, the fourth, the very bottom one there is my finish key. So unless the end key is pressed, it'll keep looping around these uh, these different things. So let's go ahead and give this a run. So I'm just going to click run if I just go to that and pull up there. So I'm using Visual Studio Code and I've got the Pico Go um, extension loaded in as well. So I can, I can hit that button there and we can see now that it's flashing that there. So if I, if I press any other buttons, nothing's going to happen. But if I press that button, it's now if I hold it in there. There we go. So it's now fading between red and black. Um, so and you can see the auto focus is trying to uh, the auto white balance is trying to compensate for that as well. So if I hold down this first button, they'll all go to a cyan, no, a green color. So that's now going to green in between the red and the black. If I press the second one and hold that in, it's going to go to a yellow color. I don't know if you can tell that's yellow on here, but it is. And then if I press the third one, it will then do that rainbow function. But if I press any other key, because of the way that I've got the code working, you can actually press these and it will light up the key with a white one whilst it's doing the fade. So if I just press that, you can see the buttons are fading in and fading out. And you can see at the bottom of the screen there, it says key one and two and three um, being pressed as well. So if I now hold down this one and wait for it to do the full cycle, it will now um, change I just wait for it to do that. I'm sure it's that key. Maybe it's that one there. It should then cycle. But there we go. Between the the rainbow color effect, so it's going to go from blue to green to yellow to orange to red, and so on. So it's just going to pulse around there. So yeah, there's quite a lot you can do with that. I was thinking about you know maybe doing some kind of chaser function where the the keys scan across. You could do all kinds of clever animations like this. You could waste loads of time doing this loads and loads of time so um and if i just hold down that very end button there it will then just stop the code and the code stop running so I've, I've uploaded this code to um i think i've shared it in uh, the description of this video so if you go to um github.com slash kevin mcleer slash p code underscore rgb keypad i think it is then you'll find that code on there Cool. So that's the the demo I wanted to show you. Um, so let me see if uh, Ovi is ready to do the interview. Are you there, Ovi? <laughs> Are you ready to go? Awesome. I'm going to uh, move over to the other scene now. So let's go back over to here. So meet the maker. So this is a new part of the show that I've not done before and I've been waiting to do for ages. And it's um, the premise is we're going to meet loads of different um, guests on this channel. Um, I've got quite a few people I've spoken to who are really keen on doing this. I'll not call them out just in case they decide later on not to do this. Uh, and I'm also going to try uh, some new functionality in the software that I use, Ecamm Live, uh, to bring in extra guests as well. So um, before we do that, I think we need a bit of a, an introduction as well. So. Okay, so let me go over to the interview mode and I'm going to bring in Ovi. And uh, hi Ovi, how are you doing? Can you hear me okay? All good? Yeah, I can. Hello. Yeah, perfect. 
and uh, just make sure the audience can yeah. hear you as well so if somebody can just comment back um that you can hear ov okay i'll uh i'll do a bit of an introduction so um ovi um thanks for joining the show um so i met ovi on uh, yeah. on facebook a couple of months it's ago a pleasure. It must have been um wow how how far back are we talking probably earlier in the year maybe january february something like that and um yeah, yeah you, you showed a picture of yeah. um yes. of your robot destro which is a uh, like a uh, an open dog type robot so it yeah. looks like a a dog kind of shape and uh, i was really impressed with this and you were reaching out on the group just to ask for some advice about how to sort of move the rope you know move the motors and stuff like that uh, and i thought wow this is this is something i need to sort of speak to so um, so Adam's just saying there that your, your audio is lagging slightly. Um, I'm not sure why that be might be, but um, we just have to appreciate that um, the the cellular networks in Nigeria can be quite flaky. They can oh, drop yeah. in and out, and um, I know power can be an issue there. But um, it's looking really crisp. The the video to me and the sound is yeah. uh, coming through really great. So Ovi, um, let's let's uh, let you introduce yourself then. So when did you first get into robotics? Talk to me about that. Um, okay, uh, it's, I think, to be exact, it was when I was young, like, I think I was about 11, 11 or 12 years old back then, yeah. and I saw a documentary, and I got really excited, because basically, what, what was shown there was all about robotics, like, one was about um, creating a jellyfish type of robot, that's yeah. able to deliver a meal, and I saw one that's like, um, a truck automobile. It has a, it had an embedded AI in it, in it. So I got I got really excited. And yeah. that's how it all sparked. I I, I I think it I it's safe to say that uh, as soon as I saw it, I got a spark, a spark lit up in me and yeah. I knew it instantly. Yeah. I am going to be going to robotics. And I think a lot of the audience will know that as well. Um that that spark that you get when you uh, when you first get into robotics and you've made something move or made something light up and it's your own creation it's there's nothing quite like that i think a lot of people will, will, will relate to that and also building something that didn't exist from your imagination as well yeah. so tell me about your first robot then i'm quite interested to know uh, you know yeah. okay okay um the first robot that i ever made was uh, one i used back then we didn't have parts we have stuff like a Dino or, or, or let's say Raspberry Pi. So yeah. what I did, I used uh, a parts, parts from generator. I used um, what's called a carburetor and a super glue, a, a glue and the head of the glue, yeah. a light bulb and a battery with some magnets. Yeah. So I added um, the two um, carburetors together and then I, connect, I kept the um, battery inside, connected the wire to it, connected it to the light bulb yeah. And as soon as I pressed the, the glue head, the glue head which was representing the um, robot head, yeah. the head lead up. Plus then I later on I later magneted like glued these magnets into the the carburetors, yeah. um ions. Some ions were standing outside of the, the carburetor. So I glued it. That was the first I think that was the first robot I ever made. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, what inspired you to create that then? So uh, I know you talked about this, um, this documentary. Um, so is, is there any other inspirations that have, um, you know, that you've, yeah. you've seen things or heard things or seen other people create stuff and you've thought, yeah, that's, that's something I want to do as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen, I have seen a lot of stuff because basically um, back then my, we didn't have, really have a lot of money. So my mom usually buy like, toys for me, like toys, when I was young, toys. So um, basically, one thing I discovered is I had this like curiosity to see what's, what's inside this, what makes it work, what makes it think, ticks. So I, I got really excited and um, um, I had a passion for like exploring yeah. the unknown. So uh, like I tried my best to like solve a problem then try to like use it to like create something else. Yeah. 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 After that, I have worked on several other projects. Yeah, yeah I, I worked on one which whereby I had an earphone, an earphone like an ear earpod. Okay, 
it got spoiled like the type you're wearing now it got spoiled so i had to like use one ear one ear i converted it to something like you can connect an earpiece to then it works automatically then later on i made a robot dog i mean no sorry a robot yeah it's actually kind of like a humanoid with cartoon it took me quite some time because basically i made several mistakes but yeah the funny thing about it is that i learned i learned from those mistakes and i try and i keep on trying to like improve my previous projects yeah. by making them more advanced more upgraded that's that's what led me to um um the robot dog yeah so tell me what you're working on at the moment then um i understand you're working on some smaller robots okay yes i i i recently finished a line following robot for a competition which i was in and i think it was um part of a brazilian competition yes we're working on we're trying to figure out which line following robot has the best accuracy then after that i try to like implement an ultrasonic sensor to the line following robot to see that if it gets its phone in a line and there is an object or an obstacle in front of it it will move to another direction then go back to that same line and continue continuing in, in its direction and after that like currently basically i'm still working on the robot dog because basically i study rather than use wood or cotton i now have filaments this is where I, this is where i'm learning about 3d printing yeah so i'm currently designing um the frame because basically if it's, it's if it's for me to like carve everything with my own hand, with like a with materials if i have the materials to carve them with my own hands, that would like be easy because i have like the kind of imagination like to think fast or like wide I, I i think it's safe to say that i have a good imagination because <laughs> basically um being an engineer or in, in the robotics field or anything that is related to problem solving you have a wide range of imagination how do i fix this what 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 make, makes it work you see so um i have been like i'm currently working on an open sea on open cv taking a course actually open yeah. series, because basically i plan on adding some several functions to the robots like um face detection object detection and and several others i would like i got i got some filaments and a usb hd webcam next to go i think it's called next to go then all i'm waiting for, what i'm waiting for now is uh, some raspberry pies and some other things but yeah. unfortunately i am unable to afford that yet so i have to wait yeah okay so what's your greatest yeah, exactly. challenge then when building a yeah. robot? Is it the programming side? Is it the mechanic side or the electronics side, would you say? Yeah, I... Okay. I think, for, to me, my greatest challenge is be like having patience. <laughs> having yeah. patience to be able to like work. Because basically, these... Yeah, basically, problems might come. Obviously, problems, problems will come. Um, it's, either, it's either going to come from the electronic side or the mechanical side or the programming the programming area but me having the patience to like sit down calm down and work on these problems i think that is my greatest difficulty yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah that's it okay and um so how do you go about designing your robots then you were talking about using um, um some cad software so um what CAD software do you use? Yeah. Okay, so I, I've, I, I have checked a lot of CAD software. I checked um, Fusion 360, but I was unable to get that one. Then I say, checked SolidWorks, but, ah, man, that one was, like, really expensive. Really expensive. So I'm, I'm currently using FreeCAD. Yeah. Yeah, I've used that too, and that's... Um, uh, still trying to figure out how the interface works. Yeah. So tell me about what do you think robotics will be like in about two years from now? Oh, okay. Basically, I think it actually depends on the persons who are inventing these projects or yeah. the robots, people who are in the robotics field. And if... If... Because basically... Each day we are waking up to a new DNA, a new area of technology. Technology is becoming more advanced and advanced. We are like, 
even AIs, uh, uh, in the case of AI, deep learning, machine learning, and other areas of technology, they are becoming more advanced. So two years from now, I say we would have, would have got, gotten really far, really far. If um, we might even have um, a, a better version of um, flying cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, the, the, I, 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 sorry, I was going to say, I know, I know Tesla have launched their own um, humanoid robot, or they've they've announced that they've not launched yeah. it, uh, the Tesla bot. Yeah. It'd be very interesting to see where they take that and how that will uh, improve upon some of the technologies, because that's a very different task than building a car, uh, making a humanoid robot. There's so many different aspects to that. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see yes. where they take that. Um, so I, I was going to... So, yeah. Sorry, I was, going to, I was going to say about. So tell me about whereabouts you are in the world, because um, some people might not not know where where you're based. Okay, um, I live in. I am from Africa, here in Nigeria. Yeah, Nigeria, and um, I'm currently located at Del in Delta States, um, number thirteen West Side Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. It's, it's a couple of miles west of Lagos, isn't it? About 100 and yes. miles west, uh, east uh, of Lagos. Cool. And uh, just a couple more questions. So, who inspires you? Is there anybody that uh, you look to in the field of robotics that you think that's the person I want to be like? <laughs> okay. I would say, I, I think it's easy to say that I have several, several persons who inspire me. And for me, I think one would be God because yeah. I'm amazed at. His creation, he being able to create the heaven and the earth, humans, yeah. and several other things is quite impressive. So that's one of my inspiration. Then another another would be um, Elon Musk and Elon Musk. Yeah. But why I said Elon Musk is that I am trying to surpass him. So <laughs> that I'm trying to surpass him. And we know I you will, Ovi. <laughs> I was, yeah, I went to the friend of mine and he was like laughing, but he said, "Keep it up." Yeah. Keep it up. Yeah. Okay. Another would be Nicholas Tesla. I found his I find his um, technology like the things he has created to be really interesting and exciting. Yeah, I even watched one of his movies. Yeah, it was really great. Yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely say Nikola Tesla is one of my um, heroes as well. Uh, him and, and uh, Alan Turing as well from the computer. Yeah. So. Um, I can hear my own voice echoing back in my headphones and it's really distracting. So I'm going to have to figure out that, I think, for future interviews. Yeah. Um, so, Ovi, now you've got the world watching, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, to say um, to the audience who's watching? And if anybody is watching yeah. in the chat at the moment, if you've got any questions for Ovi, uh, feel free to put them in the chat as well. Okay. Okay. Um, I would say that you should never give up. Yeah. Because um, growing up, like... Being in this part of the world and being into things like this, um, robotics or basically inventing stuff, I have like been criticized a lot, even in school and in at uh, my environment where I live in, even even by even by my own parents. But never give up. Keep keep moving forward. As Asta once said in um, Black Clover, it's an anime. He said that he's going to keep pushing past his limits. Keep moving forward and never give up. And basically, truly, one day you like you meet you reach your destination. Yeah. So Adam's asking, can you tell us a bit more about your robot dog? While you're doing that, I'll try and find a picture to bring up because I've got some uh, in okay. the background there. Okay. So um, I think I have the file here. Mm. I have been working on the robot dog for some time now. Like this guy, it took me like. Is it taking me up to like a year now? Yes, a year, and and it's like kind quite difficult, I would say, because basically back then it was easy for me to like work on this, though though it was hard, but I like I am good in crafting. Let me say that I didn't yeah. learn it, but I'm good in crafting, because basically I have the imagination. So when when I imagine it, I am able to like create it, put my work, my thoughts into action. But getting to know about this new technology like 3D printing and using of um, a card, a card software, I have to like start over, learn how the card software works, then start designing the parts, which is giving me um, quite some difficulties. 
if yeah. like for me i would say that if i was working with somebody who is good at um the 3d printing the card using free card i think that would be better because i wish me and the person would, like discuss share ideas then think of what next to do yeah. and i what, one thing i plan on do, doing is that i plan to implement this in like creating ai create an ai and a chatbot for the robot whereby we added a detecting contours and object tracking with cams shifts along with them face detection face recognition image segmentation human counting with open cv and plus i want to like what i'm trying to create it's actually for most people might be quite difficult but it's one of um like let me just say it's one of my dreams one of my goals to create something big difficult like i don't want to work on something that someone will call it so later on i want to work on something like to call it machine yeah powerful something like that make an impact to the world basically I've, when i'm true with this i i hopefully if i get sponsored they will be able to like manufacture these things in uh, industry and people will be able to use it in the houses because basically what this dog is all about is that all about being like like your personal security pet dog yeah just in case like you got you you left your home you left your home huh? you have a burglar so a, bur- a burglar comes in the robot dog will be able to detect like no um um notice the the, the burglar then send a a call to um the nearby nearest police station and yeah. also to you telling you as an intruder and also like if you have this like voice um, implementation that helps you, like to up to simulate this dog sound the way those um uh, um bulldogs back <laughs> so yeah. basically the, the um the guy or the burglar will become afraid and he's like going to like not think about his action yeah. basically he's going to go away and this dog might have several other functions because basically it's also going to be able to teach people teach kids yeah you could like you, the dog will be able like teach kids yes I'm going to show you um, some pictures of your robots as well. So Adam just said there, a security dog, cool. Our current dog would run away from an intruder. <laughs> I've got some chihuahuas. They would make a lot of noise, but uh, I don't think they would uh, recognize. So I've not done this before, Ovi. I'm just going to switch over back to the keynote. I don't know what that will do to your audio. Yeah, it looks like it's still there. So that's, uh, I think, Destro, isn't it, from, um, I think, without his the, head on. Um, humanoid. The humanoid I mean. Yeah. Yeah, this the I made this one with some carton and yeah, I made it with carton and I actually I, one thing I I found quite interesting was that I used um a type of like pulley system to create, create an interface whereby the leg is able to move. Yeah, once the motor shifts, it's able to move, go yeah. left, forward. It yeah, was, it was really amazing. And then the other two there, uh, so on the left, I think that's Destro, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, Destro. And uh, you, yeah. you give me a demonstration of that a while ago. And uh, the yeah. eyes actually yeah. move left and right and they light up yes. as well. Yeah. And <laughs> these were like, carving the whole body was extremely terrifying <laughs> to be exact. Yeah. Carving the whole body of the over dog was extremely terrifying. So um, sometimes I would like stay up late. Throughout yeah. the night, I didn't sleep. Yeah, like, yeah. so I had to like walk really hard most for, for this project yeah and I, and I thank god for it and then finally this picture here is uh is that the oec i'm not sure where this is yeah and um, uh, that's these, you we went for uh a boot camp we went to a boot camp where we we're teaching some kids um teaching people of agba Oto. it's it's a a i would say it's a village over here in nigeria okay yeah. so uh, we're teaching the, the um the persons there about um um, AIs, um, robotics, I- IoT, and several others. So what I was actually doing there was I like I was teaching them about OpenCV because yeah. basically I created a module whereby um, the uh, the the platform is able to detect if your face shows. Yeah, it's called face detect. So that was what I did. I was teaching them about um, how OpenCV works, introducing them up uh, uh, yeah. to it. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Ovi, for joining me today. 
uh, really enjoyed uh, having you on as my very first guest um, and meet the maker. And uh, thanks everybody for um, being patient with Thank us and you. trying this out as well. Um, because uh, this was new new technology, a new approach. I've never interviewed people before. Uh, so th thank you to Ovi and thank you to everybody else for being so patient. And uh, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll check in with you again uh, in the future, Ovi, and see uh, how you're progressing and where no Destro is up to. So um, yeah. Ovi does have a, a, a Facebook group. He's got over a thousand members of, in that group now. I'll put that into the description of this video. So that's both on Facebook and YouTube. So make sure you uh, join his group as well so you can... Uh, help him and other students as well so uh yes yeah, thank, thank you for that ovi and thanks for being uh, my first guest uh, on the show so see you later thanks for now yeah. okay so um so how did you find that as the the first interview for meet the maker did that go okay i know that there was a bit of a lag with some of the audio uh, but that might just be um um, it's, it, there's quite a few different things happening here from technology perspective. So my video is going up to restream. Um, Ecamm Live is is streaming that. Is also bringing, you know, a cellular, um, which always brings in a bit of lag um, data from from Ovi from his uh, from his setup in Nigeria, and then it's then recombining all that in my thing and then sending it back up to the cloud. So there's an awful lot of stuff going on there. So the fact that it's uh, it works as slickly as it does, um, I find quite impressive. So yes, that was uh, the, the first um, interview. Uh, let's have a look at some of the comments. Uh, I know people have been chatting away in the background there. So let me just uh, rewind all the, the comments and uh, we can go through them as well. Um, so well, let me have a look. So we have uh, Matthias from, uh, is that Brazil? What's BR? I'm not familiar with I'm, I'm rubbish at geography. I need a map on the wall that can light up where people are from. Um, so we have uh, Martin as well on the uh, the stream. Uh, Adam was saying there was a bit of video stutter. I did see um, somebody else, I think Hypotic said there was some stutter as well. Uh, I'm not sure if that's my end or whether that's Restream or Facebook or YouTube. I've looked on the, the health. Um, I can actually show you that. I get a page um, that tells me what the streaming health is like. Um uh, it, it did say that there was some um, issue a while back, so maybe that's why there was an issue. That was about quarter past. Oh, that was earlier today, so that's fine. Um, oh, but there was one. Yeah, so there was there was a bit of an issue there. Um, hopefully that's now resolved itself and um, it's not causing too much issue for everybody else. Okay, let me get back over to the comments. So Adam was saying the M5 Stacks uh, has an iffy version of MicroPython as well. <laughs> Amazon, hey, how are you doing? Thanks for joining the stream. We got Coda1448 as well. How are you doing? So Adam was saying it could be a film prop, so the uh, the RGB uh, LED. Let me just put that back on so we can get it to do it. So I've saved this as main.py, so it will always run. Um, I don't know if you can see there, that little button is flashing away. It will always run that when it starts up. So I just need to apply some power. Uh, we've got Coda man as well. Um, so hey, how are you doing? And Adam is very kindly saying, please click the like button. So notice how I didn't say that. I just said it's next to the like button. <laughs> Trying a different technique there. Um, so so um, we, um, how would you pronounce that name? Emuvial? Emuvial? I'm not very good with names. Um, I'd be surprised if Kevin doesn't have 50k subs by the year's end. That'd be really nice. I would like that. Great quality uh, content. I'll be coming back for weeks. So that's very kind. Thank you. And um, yeah, Richard was saying you could use it for cameras. Absolutely. So you might have just noticed on my desk, I have this thing called the Stream Deck. And the Stream Deck, if I can get that to focus in there, has got loads of little LED, well, they're actually OLED screens. And as I press buttons on there, I can sort of switch between different cameras and uh, different scenes in Ecamm. Um, so I can go to like my overhead and back to me again. And uh, that's all just using these buttons just to hand. So it's nice and smooth. So you could certainly use this uh, for doing that. Um, you'd have to just write your own uh, keyboard shortcut thing. You can certainly do that. Hey, Tom, thanks for joining the stream. And um, yeah, RGB keypad for the win. Absolutely. So fade in, fade out, DJ pad animation. Absolutely. You could, you could certainly use it for music production as well. So it looks pretty awesome. It looks even better in real life. The, the, the fading is really, really nice. And when it does the color cycling, that rainbow effect going from one color to another, uh, that's really, really nice. And that's using that map function. That, that works just so perfectly. Um, and sometimes it is just about finding the right piece of code and uh, using that. 
You, now, Richard, I thought the exact same thing. Whack-a-mole with lights, you totally could do that. The other thing you could do is have... Um, it's kind of a virtual fidget popper thing, whatever them thing is that the kids that love at the moment, them little plastic, like, bubble wrap, but... Uh, will be around for the next 10,000 years. What are those things? You could do that, but with uh, with this. <laughs> My daughter Alex says, hi, hi, dad. <laughs> hi, daughter. And uh, everybody's saying hello to Ovi, so uh, that's really nice as well. Cool. Um, my mum checking in there saying that the audio is all good as well, uh, but Adam's saying it's a little bit laggy. So I think that might have just been that there was a lot going on traffic-wise, data coming in and going back out again. Um, I do need to renew my broadband subscription so maybe i need to get a, a faster interconnection internet connection if i can and uh, hypotics is saying this is a great addition to the stream look forward to seeing many more awesome so i really look forward to to doing that as well so adam says some of us are scared about the ai growth because of terminator um, we're past the skynet date wasn't that in like 1996 or something when uh, skynet went live now i having built quite a few ai things it is just a function it's just a maths function so I don't think it emulates true sentience. I think you need a, a proper brain for that. You'd need to, you'd need to have, I've, I've thought about this in depth. I think you would need to bring up a robot as a robot baby and it would have to have all the experiences that a human goes through if we want it to behave like a human. I don't think this is something you could just code in um, without all those external experiences. So yes, uh, Ovi shared some of his um, more about the robot dog and if you want to know more about that have a check out of his uh, facebook group as well and uh, yeah i love the idea of the uh, the robot dog being um a security um agent it can sort of wander around your house looking for things checking everything's all right and not out the out the ordinary and about adam was saying uh, over that he's impressed with the cardboard he's, he could never get anything um, um you know using cartons to do anything so I was a bit of a master at cardboard when I was younger. I could make that do anything. I actually thought I was going to be a paper engineer when I was older. Um, so, yeah, uh, he's a man after my own heart there. So Adam was saying that the audio did catch up at one point. Yeah, I think that might just be... Um, well, it might be a couple of things, really. It might be as the audio is streaming through Ecamm, it might be an issue where it gets combined on my machine. If there's too much going on, it can... Uh... I've got an M1 Mac. This is supposed to be one of the fastest laptops you can buy. Um, but hey, this is uh, this is the web, isn't it? We've got Viden as well from Finland. Hey, Viden, how are you doing? So I hope you found this show interesting and uh, a bit unusual because we did an interview. And if, uh, if more people say the same thing, I'm definitely going to get some more guests lined up. I can think of about four or five others, including the guy who invented SMARS as well. I'm going to try and get Kevin Thomas on here as well. Uh, his first language isn't English, though, so I might have to do a pre-recorded one. Um, but just for info, when we were testing out the stream yesterday, me and Ovi did actually record um, the stream just in case it failed and we could uh, I could just switch to that. So I could do like a pre-recorded one and we could just have a segment where we show you that as well. Um, so that works too. And um, I've also spoke to um, um, uh, Camillo, who, who runs the Otto DIY. I don't think I've got my Otto DIY to handle. He's just uh, he's just behind me, just there. I'm trying to do this with the, the looking at kind of a mirror. There he is. There's Otto. Um, so he was interested in uh, coming on the show as well, so we could get um, the creator of Otto DIY. So this is why it's Meet the Maker. And I did actually reach out to um, Simon Monk, who runs Monk's Makes, uh, which is all those micro bit uh, components. So he's quite local to me, based uh, in Preston, I believe. So I uh, can get him on the show as well, hopefully. And uh, if you guys also want to appear on the show, you know, drop me uh, a message, uh, either a, a comment below and I'll get in touch with you. Just um, uh, direct message me if you want on, uh, on Messenger and we can set up uh, an interview as well. So... Thank you all for watching and uh, being so patient and kind. And uh, thank you again to Ovi for um, being my first guest. And I shall see you all next time. Bye for now.